Hello, and welcome back to another inspiring episode of The Nonprofit Show. I am Wendy F. Adams, CFRE with Cultivate for Good, and I'm excited to spend time with my new friend, Dr. Jennifer Jacobs, co-founder, CEO of Connect Our Kids. Welcome, Jennifer, and thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Wendy. It's so nice to be here with you. Well, we have lots to cover today, and I am already having a very difficult time staying in my seat as we prepare to discuss a topic that I am sure is near and dear to many hearts. I know it hits me closely, and that's our children and our families. Um, and so we're going to jump into that and hear so much more. Another um, relationship that we are excited <laughs> to have is those of our presenting sponsors. We would not be able to have these conversations without Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Staffing Boutique, Your Part-Time Controller, Fundraisers Friday, which is our episode each week that's dedicated to just fundraising, and Nonprofit Thought Leader. And so we thank them for jumping in and supporting us in having these conversations and dialogue. The other co um, conversation that we love having and what I have a pleasure of being a part of is our co-host cohort. And... Again, Wendy F. Adams, CFRE, and I am founder of Cultivate for Good. I'm riding solo today, uh, but I have the opportunity and pleasure to be able to serve alongside this team in making sure that um, we bring conversation and our expertise from across the country. And so just grateful to be able to do that. Well, we're going to jump in and have this great conversation with Dr. Jennifer Jacobs. And I want to hear and for you to share with us and our viewers, um, what connect our kids? What what's the why there? And then specifically, as your co-founder and CEO, how you're moving forward with your mission? Thank you. Yeah. So my why took a little time to develop. I my background is nuclear engineering and physics, and I spent much of my career working to counter nuclear terrorism, and I was working in that space. Uh, 13 years ago when I read an article in Time magazine about foster care. And I was really shocked uh, to learn things that many people don't know. And I didn't at that time, uh, for example, that there's over 400,000 children in foster care. Um, and if you think about taking a kid from everything they know and dropping them into a different home and sometimes from home to home to home, what that impact would be, uh, you can understand that it would be deeply significant. The other, the other thing that I learned from that article that really moved me to action was um, that foster care professionals can find a family, a home for every child, whether they reunite back with their original family or whether they go to uh, to someone that they haven't lived with before. But the work that they do to make that happen. I realized overlaps with processes that I knew the intelligence community already uses to find and map terrorist networks. And so it's a similar process, similar process work, just a different focal point. One centers around a terrorist, one centers around a child. And that that caused me to, to embark on a journey to learn more about um, the tools that are used and why the terrorist uh, fighting community has uh, multi-million dollar tools at their disposal but the foster care community uh, does similar work with Post-it Notes and Microsoft Excel. Wow. Wow. <laughs> okay, not, not where I thought you were going, but how amazing and what a superpower. I, I promised Julia that I was going to keep my passion for this topic as you know contained as possible because we've got lots to cover today. And so we're going to we're going to jump in. We're going to jump into to where and how we can all work together to, to make this better. A, a, an industry that's in crisis. Right. That's what I'm hearing. And so let's talk about connect our kids and what you're doing for the future. But before we can talk about where we're going, we got to know where we are. So what does the state of the foster care system look like? Sure. Yeah. So uh, the child welfare um, field has evolved into one that is trying to support families uh, and strengthen families in the best cases. But in some cases, the legislation and the uh, and the regulations around child protective services actually are set up to be fairly punitive. And mm. one of the 
they have unfortunately only a limited number of tools. And one of the big tools is family separation. That hits minority populations, black and brown communities, immigrant communities, uh, families with have members with disabilities. It hits them especially hard because they can look different, they can operate differently. Um, and that has caused a crisis in and of itself. So you take social workers who generally um, went into this field to help and support people, and, uh, and, and then they're not supported to actually be helpful. And that's created a lot of difficulty. We see in the news children sleeping in offices, uh, children um, having to be hoteled because they don't have someplace to, to live. And yet at the same time, social workers who are responsible for those children haven't been given the tools to reach out to the family and kin, as it's called, uh, family-like relationships that children already have and, and could be connected to. And, and you, you said it, it's, it's not that, because I think we get a skewed perspective sometimes that they just thrown their hands up and they don't, again, care or don't want to, or why they get into, they're not resourced, right? And, and so here is a state of so much coming in, not enough resource to be able to answer those. And did you say over 400,000 in That's the U.S.? Correct. Yes, over 400,000 children uh, on any given day. Uh, uh, during the year, over 600,000 children will experience foster care. Uh, there's a lot of movement in and out. And so, um, and so in, there are also statistics that uh, over the course of their childhood, one third of all children in this country will be uh, mm. looked at by Child Protective Services. For black children, that number goes up to over 50%. And you have to ask yourself if that's reasonable. Is it reasonable that over half of Black families are mistreating their children to the extent that the government needs to intervene? I don't think so. Um, the child welfare uh, field has been asked to do more than what uh, we citizens, I think, originally were envisioning. And as a result, they've been asked to take on more and more to the extent that families are being disrupted. But the children who and the children and families who do need the significant support are not able to be reached. Yeah. The, uh, the field is not resourced, but they're also not uh, given clear mission guidelines. And so it sounds like we're in a very uh, responsive and reactive space versus that proactive space. Oh my goodness. Well, what I'm hearing from you, and you said the word kin and kinship, those relationships. Um, I know personally, that's that's the way that, that I grew up, right? I, I define family and I've got wonderful family very differently um, and it's not always DNA for that very reason. What I'm hearing from you kind of takes us into that next that next place and space of well, what addresses this problem. And, and what I'm hearing is there's a space of relationship. But, right. but how and why does that really matter? Right. So we're hearing a lot now uh, about loneliness and the impact of relationships mm. or lack of relationships. Uh, the Surgeon General has, has said that loneliness is as harmful to our health as smoking uh, 15 cigarettes a day. Um, uh, the Harvard study on adult longevity identified the strength of one's relationships as as impactful to your long-term health as your exercise, your, um, your lack of abusing alcohol and, and not smoking. So we can see that that's incredibly important. And if you transfer that then to children, and the developing child's brain, what we know from science is that relationships are key to the wiring of the brain. And I like to think about it even in the context of um, those of us alive today are the descendants of those ancestors who best protected their clan, their family. So our brains are hardwired to look out for our people, our family, our kin, those around us that we know will protect us. And our brains recognize that if we don't have those people, we are in danger. Mm. Uh, the early, our early ancestors would literally die if they were kicked out of the clan. And so even though today you can be housed and fed by people that you don't necessarily feel a kinship relationship to, mm. deep in our brains, we're afraid uh, if we don't have what we consider our people around us. And, and it's so true, right? We, we recognize that only sh four short years ago when there was such a disconnect in being together mm -hmm. of what that effect had. I'm curious, how is this why 
this crucial component of relationship? How's that being received from the social work sector? How do they see this? Yeah, so, you know, it really depends. We have incredible social workers that we work with who this is their job and, and they love being able to do it battered, being able to do it for more children. Um, for example, um, one of our earliest use cases was uh, a young teenager in Kansas. And I'll just tell you a quick story to illustrate how impactful this can be. Uh, we call her Kelly. She was removed from her biological family uh, around age three, most likely for neglect, which can be anything from inadequate housing or food to in inappropriate supervision. And Kelly moved from home to home to home in foster care. Uh, because of the trauma that she had experienced, she had some behaviors that made it hard for her to stay in one home, but she eventually was adopted. And that uh, should have been uh, the opportunity for her to start a new life for herself with a new family. But unfortunately, her adoptive father sexually abused her. And, um, and as a result, she found herself as a teenager back in foster care. And she became so hopeless and despondent that she made multiple attempts on her own life, including eating glass and jumping in front of a moving car. Uh, her care team was desperate to help her. And they had tried, they felt everything. But they realized there was one thing they had not tried. <laughs> And that was to ask Kelly mm. what she thought would help. And so uh, when they asked her this, she immediately said, I want to know who I am. I want to know my biological family. I want to know where I fit in. And I want people in my life who aren't paid to be there. We all want that, don't we? Yes. And so her care team, um, thankfully, had recently been um, given access to Connect Our Kids tools. They were one of our earliest users. And they uh, in all it took them all of 20 minutes once Kelly made that request to find her mom, her dad, her grandma, and her aunt, who had been looking for her for years, ever since they had lost her. They were overjoyed to be reconnected. Her team was overjoyed to have finally been able to help her. And with, uh, with her family's help and now being able to accept the help of her care team, Kelly was able to stop self-harming, was able to start engaging in healing tools, and was able to move back with her biological family and, and start to build a new life for herself. So people who go into the field to help, they want to be able to help. And it's frustrating not to. So when we're able to give them tools and training to, to be able to do that work, people who are in a position to do it are overjoyed. Oh my gosh. Dr. Jacobs, I... I mean, it sounds so simple. It, it's a heavy lift, but it sounds, they asked her. They were willing to ask and she, she had an answer and her answer was no different than you and I. I wanna know where my beginnings are. I wanna, I wanna know who I am, right? right. And, and how that made such a difference. But what I'm hearing is, okay, that was great. Then there had to be, how do we do that? How do we answer that question? And that really takes us into the space of where does technology and the foster care system, you know, come together? How do we use tech to be able to answer that question? Yeah. So I, I always like to say, and whenever I train users or talk to potential uh, users at agencies, <clears throat> I emphasize technology is not a magic um, mm. not a magic bullet. So it is a tool. Tools are crucial. It's really hard to build a house without the proper tools, even if you're a great carpenter. But it's also hard to build a house with just the tools and no carpenter. So, uh, so both are needed. Uh, we need skilled, competent, and caring professionals, and we need great tools. And so uh, what, what Connect Our Kids, uh, the space that we uh, focus on, is scalable tools and training. We have software that helps um, that helps social workers to find, for example, to find Kelly's family. They used one of our flagship tools called Family Connections that helps just mm -hmm. using publicly available data. Uh, Wendy, if I wanted to find your phone number or, or your email, uh, it's probably out there, right? I can find it. And, uh, and for most of us, that's true. It could take a little bit of work. So our software helps to do that uh, faster, more efficiently. It doesn't use any private data. Uh, it doesn't use any privileged data. And it helps social workers to build out that kinship map because in some cases uh, it's not enough. We had a user uh, who talked about um, going to 
a, a young a teenage boy's grandmother. And the teenage boy was getting to be a handful. Uh, he was mm -hmm. in foster care and he was struggling with some of his behaviors. And that's common. And uh, when the team went to grandma, she had had a deep and close relationship with him when he was younger, but she wasn't uh, physically in a position to take physical care of him. And so she uh, was kind of concerned about that. And the team, uh, the social work team said, no, no, we, we wouldn't ask you to do that. He's a 17 year old boy who's a bit of a handful. What we're asking is for you to come around him as Ken does. Um, and do you have, he doesn't have any photos or real memories of his young years. Do you have any photos or memories you could share with him as a grandma would? And she said, oh my goodness, of course. And she went off in the back room and came back with a box of photos of this young man. Uh, and particularly the, the team took one photo of him four years old at grandma's house uh, at Christmas, surrounded by his cousins and his family and, and just being loved. And when they showed that picture to this young man uh, who, who was, you know, tough and getting in trouble with the law and, you know, he was 17 and he broke down in tears because he did not have memories of being loved like that. And so coming around him, uh, it's one thing to say, OK, we need a safe and loving place for him to sleep at night and hopefully with people that he feels close to and bonded to. But we also need people doing the other roles of kin just knowing him, providing him his memories, his childhood, uh, his connections and his place in this world. Technology can be an important piece to build out that map. Mm. We have another user who said, um, it's hard for a teenager who says they have no one to stick by that when you show them a visual map of the people who have stood up for them and who are continuing to stand up for them. There's some color coding. And so blue is the color for, you know, person who's raised their hand and said, I wanna support this child, uh, this youth, this teen. It's hard to look at a map that has a dozen people colored blue and really say you have no one. And so that's what technology can do in the hands of a skilled and trained social worker who really digs in to support that family. Unfortunately, sometimes social workers are so overwhelmed that all they can do is try to find a safe place for that child to sleep that night. And this is where the field of child welfare has gotten itself stuck. Uh, they've gotten asked to do so much um, that is not reasonably resourced or, um, or necessarily even helping that they can't dig in for the kids who do and the children and families who do need their support. And that's what our tools are, are trying to help with. And wow, I love, I mean, so many mic drop moments. First of all, just trying to contain myself here. But when you talked about, it's not a magic bullet. I mean, you started that. This You're talking about tech. That's what you're bringing to the table. And you start off by saying, this isn't the end all beyond. It doesn't fix everything. So kudos to you for, for bringing that to the forefront, but pairing it with the skilled, resourced people who are going to come alongside to be able to use that, that technology. Um, you know, our time is, is moving quickly. I could ask so many more questions in that space. Um, but something that I, and it sounds like it's being received well, so more and more people are learning, which is going to help free up some of the, the bog down that they're in. But when we talk about this place and space that we are in of collaboration, right? So that we can have more support. How can we, how can other nonprofits help in this mission um, to come alongside? Is it to get the word? What does that look like? Yeah, thank you. So uh, we're always grateful to, to those who are walking in the same mission with us. And there's a number of aspects of that. So <clears throat> Certainly nonprofits who are engaging with uh, with foster youth or, or at risk youth, um, we'd love to have conversations about how we can collaborate to further both of our missions. But also, um, and we talked about this briefly earlier, why relationships matter. That's a broad mm. space. And I'm sure that there are nonprofits out there um, listening who work in that space as well mentoring, uh, you know, from mentoring to to general family support to, to youth support to at risk support. We, uh, one of the things that we've, one of the really exciting things that we've embarked on recently is putting together training, on-demand training that, uh, that helps um, the crucial, the folks having those crucial roles understand and, and share with their colleagues why relationships matter. So 
love to collaborate with any nonprofits that work in that space around how we can get that training in front of those who can benefit from it. And that's everything from professionals to volunteers to caregivers. Um, it could be foster care caregivers. It could be biological caregivers, kinship caregivers, mentors. A lot of people, including myself, until I started to learn about this, don't appreciate the fact that a child's relationships are crucial bridges that are built in their brain. And if you take those away, just like snatching a bridge away, you can start to crumble the whole network. And so whether or not a relationship is perfect, yeah. is uh, it is still a crucial bridge and connection in their brain. And so while sometimes there are relationships that are harmful and need to be, that needs to be addressed, it has to be done in a very careful and, um, and caring way so that the child's brain understands that it's safe, that it's supported, that, it's, uh, that it can trust. Because if um, ch when children move from home to home to home, they learn not to trust. Mm -hmm. They learn to protect them. The brain learns to protect itself from rejection and abandonment by never making those connections in the first place. And that is a truly dangerous and traumatic way to build our citizenry. <laughs> and, and so nonprofits who are engaged in any aspect of that, I um, would love to collaborate in getting that mission and that message out. We have some tools that we're building around that. I'm sure others have some great tools, which we'd we'd love to learn about and, and share um, with our audiences, because it really comes down to that, that relationships matter. And, and whether that's a relationship of a, of a foster child with their biological family, with their current or future adoptive family, with their foster family, with their... Um, we had even... Um, this is such a great story. We had a user uh, agency that recently placed a teenage girl with her fifth grade basketball coach. And that relationship that she had had in fifth grade with that coach, um, what happened was they, uh, the team was trying to find a permanent placement for her and she wasn't able to go back home uh, and she wasn't uh, finding kin that, <clears throat> they weren't finding kin that were able to, that were able to take a permanent guardianship of her. And they ask her, again, back to asking asking her, right? They ask her, who do you look up to? Who's mm. been an important adult in your life that you would, if you could live with, who would you choose? And she said, you know, my fifth grade basketball coach, he always believed in me. He was so encouraging. He just seemed to really, um, really love our, our team and including me. And they use our tools to help find, you know, Coach Mark, who is Coach Mark. And they use our tools to help track him down, his current phone number and called him. And can you imagine getting a call, Wendy, that said that girl, do you remember this girl, Haley, you coached four years ago, the fifth grade girls basketball team. And uh, she's in foster care and, and she's needing uh, a place to live. And we ask her who mattered to her. And she said, you, can you, can you imagine getting a call like that? And so he, he said, you know, let me talk to my wife. And they became qualified uh, as foster parents in order to foster her. And then they uh, submitted paperwork to adopt her. So that's the power of relationships. And, and that's really what it comes down to. Our technology is an aid. It allows social workers and others to cross a chasm uh, that they might otherwise get stopped at. But they have to be on the journey. And the relationships have to be treasured and cultivated. I, I don't know how you do this every, well, I do understand because of those stories, right? Because we hear the other side, we hear the other side of the things that are going wrong. And, but to know that you're a part of something that can really make that type of difference, because yes, in that young lady's life, but also this coach who might've been like, what am I doing? Am I making a difference beyond the court? And then I'm sure he's a teacher in the midst of all of that to get that phone call. Like you said, that raises the entire tide of all humanity at that point in time. Right. Perfect. And so I, I'm just amazed by that. We, our, our time is running really short and, and gosh, so many more things. I do want to ask this question and it ties into the space of kind of where do we go from here? How do we, as the individuals, yes, representing the sector of the nonprofit sector, but individually, what can we do? Where are you seeing your, your biggest win? And where are those places of opportunity that, you know, it's all about relationships and connections that we can we can point your direction? 
Yeah. So, you know, the biggest wins are, are exactly the kinds of stories that I've shared here is when we can get uh, the, the tools in the hands of social workers and others who are able to use them in that way. Uh, where we see a challenge is really getting in front of judges uh, involved in making these decisions, social workers who are doing the work, foster parents, caregivers, volunteers, who don't fully understand uh, that deep, impactful power of relationships. And so we're working uh, now really, uh, really strongly to get that training and that knowledge out in front of these folks. I'm confident that social workers who've dedicated their lives to helping people, when given the opportunity and the tools to help people, will do that. That's, that's why they went into social work. Uh, the challenges, of course, when they're not allowed to do so, or they're they're led to believe or told things like that's a bad family. So sometimes social workers are under the impression that if you take a child from a family who has struggled to care for them, then that whole family's bad. Mm -hmm. And of course, that's not true. Um, everyone has ups and downs in life. And, and regardless of what happened in that particular home and whether or not that child can be reunited or maybe doesn't need to be removed in the first place, if we can put supports around that family, um, it's ridiculous to say that the whole family's bad. Uh, but sometimes that's kind of a mindset that, that, that has developed, I think, because of a lot of the frustrations. And so uh, we're working uh, really hard to get this this uh, the message out and the training out and the, the new research that's come out that's really emphasized this power of relationships, the importance of family and the importance of keeping people supported. And that's also, so it's one of our challenges and it's also our most exciting area of growth uh, because there I think we can make a huge difference. Well, there is a direct tie with the nonprofit sector, with everything you've said, curiosity, collaboration, you know, literally who do we know, relationships, telling the story, there's a direct tie there. So I really do hope that the rest, and I know they will be, of, of our um, audience is going to be as inspired as I was today. I cannot believe that our time is up. That was way too fast. But I just have to say that if you want to know more, when I know you do, please get in contact with, reach out and join them on the web, connect our kids, O-U-R dot org. I know that Dr. Jennifer Jacobs and her team would love to be able to educate and to, to provide more intel of how we can do this work better together, because that's exactly what I'm hearing. This is a lift for all of us. So again, connectourkids.org. Dr. Jennifer Jacobs, co-founder and CEO of Connect Our Kids, thank you so much for what you've shared today, but what you are doing each and every day with, um, with your team to make this a better space for not only the, the social workers and, the, and the, um, the children and the families of today, but really changing uh, family trees and legacy for, for tomorrow. So thank you so much for that. Thank you. We couldn't do what we're doing and and to be able to share these type of stories with you and, and opportunities, if not for our presenting sponsors. And again, want to thank Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Thought Leader, your part-time controller, and of course, our newest um, Fundraiser Friday, where we able to talk about all things fundraising each week. Um, you know, we end every show at the nonprofit show the same way. And it hits a little bit differently every single time. And it's how we can continue. It's our why doing what we're doing. And that is for us to stay well so that you can continue to do well. Thank you so much.